she died. I was lying awake one ten thousand miles away in the night, in a city where snow was falling with the softness of the flesh of a patient, on a liquid diet. And whom you knew that at some time, sooner or later, you would no longer be able to wish goodbye to. Because in her dream, she had already left behind a lifetime of fingers caused from plucking feathers from freshly spotted pigeons. Of a spine prematurely curved and twisted from watching over a slow brewing clay pots of chicken stew to mushrooms that had been soaked overnight. Of a voice hoarse from years of hacking through the, ex through the scent of blood and raw meat to ensure the crispest cut of raw pork, roast pork on every Lunar New Year's Eve. Of lungs already tarred from days of inhaling exhaust fumes when motorcyclists come to collect the machines. A life that closes with the final knowledge, just like her mother before her, of not being able to attend her grandson's wedding and seeing only the glitter from the old mountain ahead waiting. The young girlfriend of her grandson, who had spent days looking after her, turns um, uh, as he's checking his mind, um, if you were to look at this behind me, it's actually a piece of work that Megan and I did in 2010. It's called Shopping for Chopin. Um, this is actually a very interesting story. <laughs> I think it's fun. <laughs> so while he's, he feels that, let me feel in the time. Okay. Uh, there was a uh, born out of a trip okay, to Shanghai. Yes, he's back. <laughs> It was born out of a trip to Shanghai. We are actually, actually quite excitingly um, having spent three days with 30 very beautiful models in Shanghai for another project um, featuring lingerie in the arts house. Uh, and we were at the airport waiting for our plane to um, back to Singapore. And uh, we were just sitting and we were just, as usual, talking nonsense. And Shopping for Chopin came about uh, uh, when we were saying, OK, what if we wanted to do something classical? Can you write to a piece of classical music and can I direct classical music? And so th that was part of the play that productions that I did um, with the arts house. Uh, uh, I, the question. And no question yet, I just wanted to learn, learn that. So, um, so my journey with Ming Yen uh, um, kind of started from a musical point of view because um, as you all know, if you sit down and talk to Ming Yen, he can, you, you can spend hours and hours and hours with you telling you about music and telling you about his vast knowledge of music and he is also a very accomplished um, pianist you know if you put sit him next to a piano he'll be playing forever you know trying to show off so um, i'm very happy as a friend uh, to be shown the manuscript um, uh, first manuscript on the plane uh, on our way to pra uh, to to uh, Cape Town. I mean, we're, we're always meeting at all these airplanes and airports and all that. And when I saw the manuscript, I said, "Hey, Minion, it feels like um, you're writing for film music, music for um, film, and it's very interesting for me because it doesn't read like a novel, and yet there's a musical sense uh, uh, in the writing. And hence, today, as we are going to um, uh, uh, show you his book, uh, his writing, we thought." This was a very good way of um, uh, showcasing his, um, his work because I always hear music when I read his work. Okay, so uh, without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, freshly minted author, Pamela. <laughs> So I, I get a bit nervous, and uh, really thanks, thanks very much to all of you coming. Um, some of you whom I've known for 25 years, my very first teachers here in the US are here, um, Dr. Long and Dr. Lee. I, I thank you very much for making me go here. And um, okay, uh, you know, um, uh, there was a question, right? So you just, so you just asked me, right? Okay, uh, so. Um, a friend of mine, who we started as colleagues first in, in, in the arts magazine, and when I told her I was going to launch a book, the first thing she said was, 
you mean you're going to talk at your book launch? And, and I said, yeah, I guess so. Um, but uh, uh, just another word, um, point two, uh, so give me the three points. And, um, you, you know, that, that, uh, when, when Mr. Fong and Jeremiah were describing the book and, you know, they were graduating the book, I got a bit nervous because I'm not quite sure if all these wonderful words you say was a book I wrote, I'm not quite sure. And, 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 and I was telling somebody, don't congratulate me yet, read the book first, you may not like it, so I get a bit nervous. And, and two weeks ago, I, I, I panicked them. And, and I was glad my friend and colleague Paul Rosero was there. I, I, I really panicked. I, I just got quite very nervous because I was wondering, oh dear, what have I done? You know, and, and whether, you know. And the third thing is about music. Um, I, I, I wrote the book because um, I, I failed twice to get a job I really wanted to get. And that was like, uh, you see, I, what I really want to do is to, to be the, uh, 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 you know, the, 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 the radio, uh, what do you call it? Um, Pro, the DJ or programmer for 92.4, you just talk and then you play classical music. Two things I'm quite good at, talking and then press play button. So I, don't, I don't mess up anyone's life that way, really. So, but then when I went for the voice test in, after I had my third year, I, I, I failed my voice test, the voice test again. Then, then I was very silly, I went for the voice test again after you know, I finished my office, and then failed again twice you now. So, oh, desperation, I guess the meeting and Thought I could do properly was right, so that's how I became a journalist. And really, I mean, I had a choice that like, I would just talk about music and just play music over radio, which is I think more fun. And and since I couldn't do that, I, I thought I'd write a book about music. Simple as that. Okay. Uh, since this is a book launch and you've heard passages from it, uh, I just like to invite any questions or any comments from your uh, from you, uh, so that Ringen can uh, address. Anyone has anything to say or ask about Ringling's work? Actually, you know, I was, uh, he, he did give me a kind of call uh, about a week and a half ago. I remember having this conversation with him and I said that um, the one thing about being an artist is that we put ourselves out there for people to look, judge or read or whatever it is. If it comes from our own heart, it doesn't matter whether people really like it or not. But at least we have, as artists, um, expressed ourselves, and I think that is a very, very important um, um, uh, first level, first platform for ourselves. You know, to have our, our work up there first. Whether people like it or not is a second, secondary thing. Of course, of course, I think we all want people to love us, right? As artists, but I, I think um, it is important that we put ourselves out there first. Um, of course, sometimes people will um, think otherwise of our work, but I think for an artist to actually put the work out there, it, is, it takes a lot of courage, and it, takes, it needs a lot of encouragement as well um, from, from people like you and people in the society you know, who will then look at the work and then form opinions about it, and whatever it is, I think it's still positive. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. As, as I said, I, I, I did not realize. It was very fun. Like, I spent the last nine years of my life being an arts administrator. It's very nice when you, you know, I think goes wrong. It's a boss's fault or someone else's fault. But then I realized that, uh, that when one starts writing, I, I really felt very bad. I, I felt very responsible towards my publisher, the, the people who get the grant to publish the book, and. And, and the people who, who supported it, um, you know, um, Mira Chan is here who, who kindly read the manuscript twice. So I, I just only felt, yeah, this, yeah, I wonder what I wrote myself into. So it's, and then I called Jeremiah and I suddenly realized how much I appreciate, I think, more the people um, that as an arts manager, which is what I do for, for a living. Um, you know, I, I think it's been a very humbling experience. I think the cross of this is important. Uh, from being an art administrator, that's why he always calls himself, to becoming an artist. And I always call him a closet artist because working with Ming Yen, he, he has a lot of um, uh, wonderful ideas, but he often has this other hack that he couldn't get out of. That is the administrator job. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's good. I think finally he has um, fulfilled one of the ticks in his life, you know, writing a book. I'm sure there are more to come. And uh, I hope he writes more. 
Thanks. Uh, on that note, I would like to thank here my publisher and uh, my designer and, and the team, uh, Adelina, all right, and uh, Alvin Yap, and uh, the who designed the book and Mr. Fong, because um, when the book was, was, there's one thing about the layout of the book, which I'm, uh, it, this one is particular because uh, when the book was laid out uh, originally, I, I thought it was the, the words ran a lot, so I said, I really wanted white space, a lot of white space. And, and I told the designer, please, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, I, I, I mean, when I wrote it, when I wrote the stories, I, I kind of saw them, the words as, uh, you know, in, in, in music, there's phrase marks, there's empty bar lines, and a few rest here and then. You can't do that with words. So I just wrote that. And, I just kind of imagined that. I just thought, okay, I'm gonna read it when you get it. But, but then, but then, I realized it doesn't work that way. So, so I told the designer, please, um, you know, um, do what you want with the text. You know, lay out the way you want. But I just want a lot of white space. And of course, that means cost. And, and I felt like that too because more white space with four pages is more cost. So I'm very glad, you know, my publisher did it. Mr. Fong very supportive. And the thing about the layout is that some of the layout there, uh, actually I didn't envision it that way. And uh, one of the stories, one of the ghost stories, um, yeah, one of the three ghost stories there. Um, one of quite scary actually. Uh, okay, thanks, Rob. Yeah, I, I, I didn't realize they were quite scary. Um, okay, but the three ghost stories there, and one of the ghost stories there, the designer had actually created a space, and, and it skipped my eye until Jeremiah told me, hey, you know, this space is very good. I said, why? Then he told me he read the story in another way, and I was thinking, Oh, okay, let's keep that. And then I said the rest, oh my gosh, she's created so much space between some of the stories. So some of the spacing you see there, um, she created that. You know, and I thought it was very nice to work, you know, in that way with a uh, with, 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 with design. Any good questions for Megan? Yes, uh, two. <laughs> Hang on to that. Then. Sir, is there a stand-up? Oh, thank you. Let's have I want to ask you again, which came first, the stories or the music? Because I know you love music and, and this music probably means something special to you. But how do you fit the stories with the music? Which one came first? It is a very dangerous question, so I was hoping no one will ask. Um, okay. You know, I, I was thinking that somebody will ask this question and I couldn't figure out what's the answer. Okay, um, okay the, the, the truth is that... Uh, And this is this, this is a question that I wish I was a moderator, not that. Okay, uh, and I think for in most of the cases, the, the, the music came first. Um, because like what 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 you just heard, that comes from uh, Yana Checks uh, on an overgrown path. It's, it's a set of very nice miniatures which many people play and, and and I love it. The, the second piece which which I which I played, that, that the first time I heard it was was it used in the film uh, Philip Kaufman's The Environment and as a being. Um, I like it so much, and but very good cool play, and, and I thought, wouldn't it be fun if one wrote something to it, or, or if one could just... Okay, I, I mean, I'm, I didn't succeed being a musicologist, so I can't do that, so I thought I'd like, try, try writing it. And so, yeah, um, so, so yeah, the, the, the music in, in that instance, and then uh, the, the, the other piece which... Um, and there was another piece which I got obsessed with recently, which is the, the fourth open from Mala Swift. And so and I said it'd be nice to do something to that. And, and then uh, in Shopping for Chopin, as uh, Jeremiah said, well, that was very really tricky. Um, uh, there's a background to that, uh, further than what Mr. Choi has said. It, it grew up originally because I selfishly wanted to make Jeremiah act as to play Chopin. Um, it, for Chopin's bicentenary, he refused to. And so it came onto that. But but that one there, yeah, we I, I chose part of the narrative, actually looking for pieces of Chopin which would fit make the narrative so interesting. So so actually, and and there were many other things I wanted to write about, but but I um, I didn't because there was nothing interesting musically. And and recently, what I was listening to a piece of music. This is a slow movement from Schubert's C major quintet. It's a gorgeous piece, and, and and if you have seen the film Conspiracy, which is about uh, please tell me if I talk too much. Um, um, there's a film called Conspiracy with Kenneth Branagh, and it's an interesting film because the film recreates um, an entire meeting that was held in 1942. It's called the Wannsee Conference, 
And the result of that conference was a document which is now known as the Lansing Protocol. The minutes of the meeting has disappeared, but the document that summer that was an outcome of the meeting exists. And what this film does is it recreates the entire meeting based on the document. But what was interesting with the of this clinical conspiracy was the one state of the code is the only known document which justifies, which explains an official document which explains the whole, which uh, um, allows the Holocaust. Which is the only known. So what happened was that at the end of this whole film, the, the guy who calls the meeting, um, Heydrich, Reinhard Heydrich, was at the time head of, I think head of SSN. He was a horror, he was a very nice man, um, to say the least. Um, you know, they killed him, and uh, anyway. And then out of revenge, they, they actually, the Germans remembered an entire village called the Vichy in, 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 in the Czech Republic. But anyway, at the end of the film, um, Heinrich, you know, very, very successfully justified why they were exterminating all these people. He puts on a record. And the music that closes the film is the slow movement from Schubert's uh, C major pretense, gorgeous. And I was just listening to the video, and then I thought, maybe I should write something to this. And then I told myself, I don't think I should do it again. But, uh, so uh, I think the music is very important. Yeah. Just a quick, quick before I come to you. Yeah, um, we did discuss that when uh, Mingyi was uh, still in the final stages of the manuscript, and um, I felt that um, because of the way Mingyi writes, uh, he writes to music that he hears in his mind. It is also quite interesting to recreate that for you. So uh, for those of you who have bought the book and you intend to read it, I would also suggest that there is another way of reading it that's putting on the piece of music that we have suggested in the book. And as you hear the music, you read it, uh, it will give you a, a different colour altogether. Right? Of course you can read it in the bars or anywhere else, but it is, um, I think, quite crucial uh, uh, to me, uh, especially for shopping for Chopin, for you to understand his rhythm when he's writing it. Uh, to me, that was um, um, quite fascinating. Okay, let me just pass that book that might appeal to you. I'd like to say that I, I like Piano Chat very much, so I recognize the first piece. And I wondered whether you were writing to your favorite pieces of music, or whether in the process of writing the book you discovered new pieces. Um, okay, thank you. Actually, I was writing uh, to yeah. Actually, I was writing to my favorite pieces of music, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. It was it was more to the music than, than, than I knew. Um, did I discover anything along the way? Uh, no, I, I, actually, maybe not yet. Any other questions for me? Yes. Can you demonstrate from the chapter or the, or the section how the rhythm of the music uh, echoed in the, in the text? Oh, okay, uh, this, is a, this is a very good question. And, and, uh, it's a very dangerous question too, yeah. because we can the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, and actually that's a, that's a very good excuse to talk about the next, about the next piece we're going to do. So, okay, um, okay thanks Kachai for leading. I was wondering how to lead on to the next reading and, and you just asked a question. Um, that there is a there's a piece in there. Um, don't mind if I talk a bit. Um, as I said, I, the, the real reason it's kind of music and talking about music. Um, okay, um, there, there's a piece in there which I mentioned earlier, which I've got really obsessed about. Um, not obsessed, just about fascinated with it because um, for some time I've been very intrigued by tempo relations in music and and the actual impact of the music. Um, you know, um, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a piece of music, you know, Beethoven's fifth and Beethoven, the, uh, everybody knows the first movement, right? But the second movement, someone did a study, and what happened was that um, apparently after the Second World War, the performance tempo of the slow movement of Beethoven's fifth got slower, got slower you know? and, and, and somebody actually ran out all the entire, um, the, 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 what do you call the different, uh, Recordings and at which point it got slow, and, and the reason was that apparently um, after the war, because the piece got so um, associated with uh, you know ideas of victory and nationalism and all that, they, they, the, the second movement entirely took on the whole new meaning. And and that leads to the next piece, which which uh, which actually drove me a bit crazy for a while. 
Um, this is um, the, the slow movement uh, under Jethro from Marlon's uh, hip surgery. Now, um, what happened was that, that for those of you who may know this work, um, what happened was that until it got popular around 1968-1971, when uh, it was used twice on two occasions. The first occasion was um, at the funeral of uh, Robert F. Kennedy, when Bernstein played it, and then in 1971 in the film Death and Venice by Eugene Olson, it is based on 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 the on the book by Thomas Mann. And and for nearly 30 years, that, that piece of music, uh, you know, took a long time to play, but around 11 minutes. And um, and everybody associated with death and all that, you know, uh, that's what film can do for you. Um, I'll, I'll play a bit of it now. Um, so we, so can I have the first track? This, 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 is, this is how it generally is going to play out. I told them, I wish it was a radio DJ. Keyboard hitting back at her. 
We thank you that throughout all should be 